Live truth, speak truth. This is the Jacob Kersey Program. Welcome to the Jacob Kersey Program. Have you noticed corporate wokeness has dominated all your favorite businesses, all your favorite products? It doesn't take long to notice that wokeness has infiltrated really everything right down to the places you shop, to the things that you buy. We're going to be talking about that in this episode, as well as you've probably heard a the phrase, wall of separation of church and state. Do you know what that means? Or what about this? Do you know where that phrase comes from? We're going to be talking about that as well. But first, let me tell you about Ramika Designs. Look, whether it's signs, home decor, cutting boards, drinkware, really things that you use every day. It's so much better when it's personalized, when it has your name or some or a phrase you like when it's put on that. That is what Ramika Designs does. They do custom laser cuttings and engravings on almost all materials. You can't get better than something that's personalized to you or your friend or your company or your or that special someone in your life. Go to Ramika Designs dot com r o m i k a designs dot com to make it easy if you just click the link in the show notes you'll save twenty percent so check out the show notes in order to do that well it's become increasingly evident in recent years that large corporations all over America have been espousing the secular left's ideology whether it's climate change demographic diversity, progressive social justice, transgender ideology, LGBTQ plus agenda, or other courses, causes championed by the left. For instance, just look every June, more and more corporations change their logos to reflect their solidarity with the LGBTQ agenda. Former employees have shed light on company meetings and employee trainings that push critical race theory, or transgender ideology. Consider Disney, we talked about recently, encouraging their employees to apologize for their whiteness. Never mind the fact that they can't help that they were born white. But in this country, even if you were born LGBTQ, you don't have to apologize for that, but you do have to apologize for being born white. Imagine that. Or perhaps Pfizer, who created a fellowship that excludes whites and Asians from applying in the name of equity. Did you hear about Coca-Cola teaching employees how to be less white? Or what about United Airlines establishing a quota system based on race and gender for pilots in the cockpit? Never mind whether you're qualified or not. We want to look at your gender and your race. Are you a Major League Baseball fan? Well, in 2021, Major League Baseball decided to move the All-Star game out of Atlanta. Do you wear Nike? Well, they donated tens of millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter, which, by the way, is a Marxist movement that is for the eradication of the nuclear family structure. Have you ever thought... Just think about this. Have you ever thought to yourself, while eating an M&M, that you know what would make this world a better place if this green and this brown M&M that I'm holding in my hand and enjoying right now identified as a lesbian couple. If only this small, candy-coated chocolate goodness screamed my political agenda, that would truly make me happy. Because even the candy we eat is not safe from being drawn into our political wars. As my friend Andrew Olivastro at the Heritage Foundation pointed out, in the name of eliminating racism, these woke corporations are making everything about race. So much for equal opportunity. He said, many Americans invest in these corporations to make a profit, but don't realize there are growing numbers of people that want to impose their political and cultural preferences on the world And they want to use your money to pay for it. 
So what do we do about all this? Well, joining me now is Paul Fitzpatrick. He is the CEO of the 1792 Exchange, which is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to develop policy and resources to equip to protect and equip nonprofit small businesses and philanthropy from woke corporations. And Paul is joining us now. Paul, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's a, a real honor to be on here. Well, well Paul, in, in my home state of Georgia, Coca-Cola and the Major League Baseball in 2021 fought against Georgia's election reform law. So it, it's quite troubling to me that it seems that everything, right down to the entertainment that I watch and the Coke that I drink while I'm watching it, has all become political. Well, it, it, it's very, very troubling. Um, and really what it is, it's a symptom of a bigger problem. And the problem is the left has captured institutions in America to politicize them. Policies that they can't get passed in the legislative process or maybe have the courts imposed, uh, they have very effectively worked to capture institutions from academia to the media. Uh, and so, and uh, certainly even a lot of philanthropy to drive it. And the last institution that the left had not captured but they've been working on it for decades, is corporate America, because they realized that the power, the influence, the reach of large, generally large public corporations is, in many cases, they it's more impactful than the federal government. Um, and, and certainly they also realize that, of course, they've captured many aspects of federal government. I failed to mention that. But working in concert, when big government works in concert with big business, um, it is an amazingly powerful force. So, so when did all this happen? Because, I mean, maybe 10 years ago, I didn't notice, you know, these corporations being at least as vocal as they are now. So when did all this start occurring? Well, I mean, the, the left, my understanding is the left really started targeting corporations after President Reagan won in 80, realizing they had to make inroads. And it, and it is true what they did is they started heavily in the in the 90s coming in through hr departments human resources departments and training programs that were pushing policies that uh, encouraged corporations to get behind policies that they didn't have to legally sometimes it included providing uh same-sex benefits for domestic partners even if there were no just domestic partner legal legally in that state it had to do with corporations funding embryonic stem cell research or getting involved in some political issues. And, and that began to grow. But in, in a, a pivot point was in 04, the UN developed and really this whole concept of environmental, social and governance principles. They uh, developed as, as a model and a means, really criteria to drive decision making and investments and how capital would be allocated. And they they expanded that, started socializing that with companies. But what would happen with the last financial crisis, 08, 09, after that, after these big financial institutions were bailed out, frankly, both the left and the right, Republicans and Democrats were mad at these corporations. And the corporations realized they needed to do something to, to regain um, basically their foothold, but also to, to make money. Remember that the, at that point, there's tremendous downward pressure on in the investment funds with these index funds growing. <clears throat> that was starting. And so the brilliant corporate mind said, hey, we can charge more by having an ESG fund. We're going to win the favor of the left. And we initially, we're not going to, you know, the Republicans and folks on the right see, they're not going to see business as any different. They'll just see us as wanting to sell ESG funds to people who want ESG funds. That was fine. And it's true. If I want to put my money in an ESG fund, which those you know billions of dollars flowed into it, which is fine, it's their prerogative. But what happened over time is the left, in part, what they were doing is they leveraged in the in the years after that, they the folks running the big pension funds, the public employee pension funds in California, Illinois, New York, got frustrated. They want to see a faster pace of corporations and these big asset managers, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, using their assets. To, and their leverage to push companies. So that started happening. And really, over the last three, four, five years, the big asset managers I mentioned, who are just managing other people's money, they don't own the money, they're managing other people's money, they started voting the shares in, in, in 
when you have a public company, your listeners may not know, when you have a public company, there are resolutions, shareholder resolutions that shareholders vote on. Sometimes it has to do with board members, but also can have to do with other policies relating to the company. And some of these very activist shareholders started pushing ESG policies. And what is ESG? Environmental, social, and governance principles. So you saw a lot of environmental saying, shareholder resolution saying we're we're going to encourage this uh, fossil fuel based company to get to net zero carbon neutral by 2050 or we're going to phase out and phase in green quote green project green energy projects <clears throat> that really happened that explosion of this pressure from the asset managers was over the last five years <clears throat> now what we've seen and I'll pause here but we've ne- we've started to see a pushback from a lot of folks which is very encouraging Okay, so you talk about the the pushback from a lot of folks, and, and and I do agree that that is encouraging. But why do we not see any major corporation championing conservative ideas or or American exceptionalism, or just trying to get corporations to go back to to being neutral and, and not being political war machines? Well, to be clear, that is our objective. We don't want corporations to be Republican or Democrat or Christian or not Christian or liberal or conservative. We want corporations to focus on maximizing shareholder value. And of course, being good to their employees, to their suppliers and their communities where they operate. So we want them to move back towards neutral, <clears throat> to depoliticize. But the the leverage that is put on them from activist employees, from activist shareholders, activist board members, and then the massive asset managers and it and it's I mentioned the big three asset managers, the, the big banks are in line as well, but then there are these groups called proxy advisors. They're two big ones. It's a duopoly, ISS and Glass Lewis. They're hugely influential in this process of shareholder resolutions and votes. And all of that pressure that's coherent, coordinated, leveraged, is all pushing companies to, to move their policies to the left. And of course the media reinforces that. The right, historically, and conservatives have been ineffective and disorganized. And so that's why you see corporations only going one way. And, it, and if, to be honest, it is, um, it is a true religion for many of these folks. ESG is a religion. Um, the, clearly, folks, when you look at each of the, the pillars, the E, the environmental, the S, the social, the G, the governance, each has people who will cling to their death to those principles, even though many of those principles are based on fallacies, and they actually harm people, including the people they're claiming to help. And so it is, um, it's not easy to get someone to give up their religion, uh, even though it's a false religion. So, Paul, I, I'm, I'm curious, do you think it's possible for corporations and businesses to ever be neutral again? I, I mean, and the reason I ask this is because it seems that the left has gone so far, so far as to call for the abolition of free speech, biological sex, religious liberty, and God-given rights and principles that make America exceptional. I mean, even if a corporation doesn't become like a battleship for conservative values or, you know, Republicans or libertarians, just like if you just consider Elon Musk, he he posted or he tweeted out, I don't really remember how long ago this was, but he tweeted out a political sp- spectrum line where you know he said like 20 years ago here's where I was I was slightly on the left politically and he and then he showed where the line has gone so far where the left has gone so far left that he hasn't moved but now it looks as if he's on the right when he's really just for free speech and and for corporations like you said being neutral but that seems to be a right leaning idea these days well it it, it is true that uh, as the left has moved farther left um, they have, they certainly have alienated many folks. You see that in the South. The South used to be you know, solidly democratic, but the party and the leaders went far, far left. So a lot of the folks became Republicans. Um, there are activists that have just pushed boundaries because they've captured institutions, including I, I didn't, I failed to mention the church, and many churches have been captured by the left. Um, mm-hmm. Not all, thankfully, but it is, it is. That's where it's, it's a challenge in our culture for corporations to be neutral. But I will say a couple things. Not all corporations are embracing all of these principles and and uh, 
are pushing it aggressively. Um, there are some celebrity woke CEOs who clearly uh, enjoy pushing a, a progressive agenda, and we're not going to change their minds. But there, there are lots of CEOs and thousands of people, including in the C-suites of these companies, they just want to run a, a good business. And But the problem is they don't want to be run over or canceled. And what we want to do is we need to encourage them and help them, not beat them up, um, try to give them off ramps towards neutrality. Because again, these, these are great American companies. We want them to do well. We have friends and neighbors and family members who work in these companies. And by the way, about three quarters of all the assets in the stock market in the US are tied in one way, shape or form to retirement. So Americans retirement security depends on corporations increasing their shareholder value, right? Increasing their stock price going up. And if they're taking their eye off the ball, and those companies that do take their eye off the ball, I believe that even if short term, they may do better. You know, for example, they may they may get subsidies for wind or solar batteries, things like that, um, which many of them have really great negative consequences. And also they, they don't make sense without taxpayer subsidies like solar and wind. Um, they largely just don't make sense. But there are companies and people who want to do the right thing. And if they stick to their knitting and focus on just being providing good products and services and taking care of their employees and their communities, and of course not polluting um, and taking care of the environment, then those companies long-term, I think will do better financially than the companies that have embraced and put on the jersey of a political party and these agendas in essence is what they're doing because they're alien, they're dividing their employees and alienating roughly half of the country. So I, I do believe the data will bear it out. And I we are seeing this now. If there's financial data on the investment returns, the stock price, the returns, and the just the financials of companies that are aggressively embracing ESG versus those that are not. And the data, the data will speak for itself, thankfully, for many companies. Now, to be clear, there's some that are doing very well financially uh, waving the ESG flag. So, so you're the, so you're the, the CEO the, the, of 1792 Exchange, and, and there's a new spotlight report that, that came out. I, I, I guess it was recently. Um, I saw a, a news article come out about it recently. But basically this report, and, and you can go into more detail, but it assessed 1,000-plus companies to determine the likelihood of them terminating business relationships due to differing, differing points of, of political views. So, so walk us through the the creation of this report and and its findings. Absolutely, and, and big picture, why we're here, uh, we've been talking about ESG. ESG married woke corporate virtue signaling, and their baby is cancel culture. And what cancel culture? We saw it explode in 2020, where if if you didn't support BLM or said something, or you did support Trump, or you did said the wrong thing on COVID. You saw people and corporations and nonprofits, small businesses get debanked, deplatformed, canceled, have, have a lot of their services, critical infrastructure services canceled for ideological reasons. So we developed this corporate bias ratings, and it's the first in a series in their spotlight reports. And we're, we're putting a spotlight on this behavior. And the key is this is a tool to equip and protect small businesses and nonprofits. So we've evaluated over a thousand companies on their likelihood that they will cancel a customer or deny service or divest for ideological reasons. And so uh, the idea is that if you're running a small business or a nonprofit or, or your family, that you would log into this, go to 1792exchange.com and go to their our corporate bias ratings, 1792exchange.com. And you could put in put your bank in there, for example. That's a, that's a good example of, of where to start. Uh, but there are others as well. So again, the two audiences are one: we want the the the, the consumer, the person who's um, relying on the business, to look at this database. But we also hope companies that folks within corporations too, two pieces of it. If you're if you're an employee and you pull up your corporation and, and you realize it's doing it's pushing a, an ideological agenda that's very progressive that has nothing to do with the business. It's somewhat risky. We we understand, but you might want to point that out to your your supervisor or senior management. Um, again, that's a that could be a risky proposition, as you know. You, people could lose their jobs. Yeah. But the other is yeah. the other is we we hope 
corporations and executives will look at this and say, look, that they they will be able to use this as an example to say, look, we don't want to have a high risk rating. That's how we rate them, high, medium, or lower risk, likelihood of canceling or denying. And, and so they can use that. They're armed to go in to, in conversations in the C-suite and with the boards to say, we need to not engage on this divisive issue and we need to tone down and not support that legislation that has no business, no relationship with our industry or our, our business. And so that's what we've looked at. And, and I'll, I'll give a little bit about the uh, criteria on the database. Um, we're, we're looking at the how the companies, um, it's really six criteria. Have they previously denied service to a customer on their charitable giving? Do, do they uh, basically not allow giving to religious organizations? On their employment practices are, and their policies, are they protecting employees against viewpoint discrimination? Um, how does a corporation use its corporate reputation or their brand to support ideological causes? How do they use their corporate funds? And then finally, is there are there political contributions used for ideological purposes that are not related to their business? And so we come up with a with a score, and again, high, medium, or lower risk. And uh, we hope folks will go there and use it and print it off. And as I was saying, an example, you know, you may not most of your listeners may not realize their local bank. They may be at a at a city bank or a J.P. Morgan Chase, which has canceled folks um, for ideological reasons. And you, you print it out. You walk into your local branch manager and say, I saw you did this. And just politely and calmly and quietly ask to speak with that person and talk and say, I saw you do this. I'm concerned that you might cancel my small business or nonprofit. Let them know that that's a concern. And then, then say, would you would you be willing to change the terms of our contract with my organization so that you I'm protected because I like doing business with you. And so we want to, we hope that that folks who come to the database will change their behavior and that ultimately will change the behavior of corporations so that they can just be, be great corporations, not arms of a political party, either political party. Well, and I'm, I'm grateful for that report and, and its findings and, and, and the things that it, that it points out. But, but Paul, for everyday Americans that, that choose not to bend the knee and do exactly what you say, print off you know this report and its findings and, and go into their local bank or their corporation or wherever and you know point out their concerns, that could, that could be you know detrimental to, to their job or their business or their, their, um, their class at school. In the name of of tolerance and acceptance, these companies and corporations are are saying we will not tolerate or accept anyone who does not join us in waving our ESG or woke flag. And for Americans that do wake up, I mean that that could cause serious repercussions for them. Well, I, I you know, Scripture calls us to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Um, and so, uh, I'm not suggesting every employee walk in um, and demand a conversation with the CEO or post on social media that they hate what their corporation is doing or do the same with their college professor. Um, what we need to figure out is how can we, in a winsome way, use our influence, um, knowing that, it, that sometimes there could, there could be serious repercussions. I do believe we uh, conservatives and people of faith do need to stand up and link arms. And if, if, frankly, if we all did that, the corporations would 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 respond, um, even though there there could be some some folks who have you know unfortunately repercussions, like you said, grades, jobs, all that. Um, but we do have to speak out. the 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 thing that we believe in is we believe in the market, and and what we're hoping and praying for is that corporations that. Uh, that stand that we would see major corporations stand up and say we are we are going to serve everybody we are not going to get caught up in ideological fights or really be used to advance someone's ideological divisive ideological agenda from either side and um we believe that if those if corporations did that we believe consumers whether you be you know to be a business if it's a business to business kind of situation or it's uh nonprofits or or it's a consumer driven business we believe that the, the customers will flock to the businesses. I think all, customers of all stripes will flock to the businesses that serve everybody with excellence and just provide good products and services at a good price. And then 
over time, they will do well financially. And that will put tremendous pressure on those corporations that have been politicized. It'll, and it'll empower the voices inside those to say, hey, can we depoliticize? Can we stop the divisive stuff? Um, but I, I do believe um, it's going to be a challenge. I, I will say uh, for your listeners, they need to know that there's the pushback began about a year, year and a half ago. And you see courageous state treasurers and straight state attorneys general. And now you're seeing legislation starting to move in, in state legislatures this this spring. Uh, right, right, right now, the, the sessions have started in most states that there is a pushback. It's a it's a very, very thoughtful group of people. These individual treasurers and AGs and legislators are under, are going after the, the financial and fiduciary problems with these positions, the legal and antitrust problems that corporations face. Um, and I think that what you've seen is seen some toning down. It's not not entirely, but a, but a, some toning down. For example, one of the big three asset managers um, is Vanguard. Vanguard recently pulled out of the Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance. That's an that's an alliance of it's either fifty or seventy um, trillion dollars. I mean, they, they, it is massive dollars that that are managed by the global, these worldwide companies, um, and they're you know they're at, they're at about eight and a half trillion. Uh, Vanguard, Vanguard said they are pulling out of that alliance. And what was that alliance? That was a corporations coming together to say, with it with a UN aligned in, entity, that we are going to move in our portfolios, in, in what we do, how we spend our money, how we invest, we're gonna move to carbon neutral by 2050, the world. We're gonna help get the world basically to align with uh, you know, the Paris Accord, which US didn't sign. That we're going, in essence, to do that, you have to get rid of oil, coal, oil, coal and natural gas. Um, and that, that's what these alliances are doing. And, and which is one, antitrust behavior because they're they're by definition choking off capital to those industries and those products. But um, that is a huge positive step by Vanguard to say, we are gonna pull out of that. I believe it's in part because they realize their legal jeopardy and their lawyers were smart enough to know that they are willing, that's a fight worth taking them taking on the heat from the left, because I guarantee the heat from the left is greater than the heat from the right. Mm. And um, they're getting beaten up. I'm sure their CEO is getting beaten up. He had a, there's an art, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal just today, um, this February 27th, we're recording about the, his CEO. So your, your listeners could look that up. Major corporation that's moving more towards the middle. I, I, there are lots of other things that they need to change at Vanguard, but I'm just saying, that is a huge step and it's encouraging and we want to thank and encourage companies that are making the wise decisions. Yeah, and I, I love the the imagery that Andrew Alvaster, the Heritage Foundation, uses when he talks about CEOs used to be quarterbacks, you know, even when they took hits, you know, if you watch a football game, sometimes you'll see a quarterback taking a hit from a big, you know, powerful linebacker or defensive end. And yet that quarterback, his eyes are downfield watching where that ball went, even as he's, you know, forced to the ground forcibly. I wish we had more CEOs that do that. And, and I'm grateful, you know, that you pointed out that Vanguard um, has leadership that is saying, you know what, we, we don't want to go down this road. Uh, and I hope we'll, we'll see more of that. And I'm grateful for, for what you and the 1792 exchange is doing. So I guess my, my final question is, before you know you share how the audience can connect with you in 1792 Exchange, is what does a concerned American do? If they're listening, you know, mo most of the audience probably has a nine to five job. You know, they're aware of all the wokeness in these corporations and maybe they voted with their dollars in the sense of when they have an opportunity to stop buying, you know, uh, Starbucks, they'll go buy Seven Weeks Coffee. We, we had the founder of Seven Weeks Coffee on the show recently. So they're using their money, uh, you know, to promote their values. But but just generally, what what is your encouragement for a concerned American? What do they do um, with with all this woke corporatism? Well, uh, it, you know, we each have a sphere of influence. Obviously, if 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 your your listener is running a small business or a nonprofit or a ministry, they're a customer that's probably bigger than an individual consumer, and so they could let their 
the vendors and the organizations that they work with, um, whether it be you know the banks and payment processors and everybody with whom they work, if thank them if they're staying neutral, especially if it's a bigger company, but but also let them know you, they're concerned if they're not, if they're engaging ideologically. Write write to folks, write to the CEO, go and talk to people, um, and just have a calm conversation. Just very briefly share concerns. For individual consumers, I think they do the same. It, it, you know, corporations don't, you, you contact um, investor relations or the public relations departments if you say, hey, I'm not gonna buy your coffee, I'm gonna buy that coffee, and this is why. Um, and it, you do you do two. One, you, you tell the company that you're leaving why you're leaving, and they tell the company that you're going to why you're going to them. Um, and I think that is a positive way um, for folks to do it. You know, it, it, I make no, indiv as an individual, it's not gonna make a difference if I should go to Starbucks or not. I mean, yeah, in, in a larger scheme of things, but if, if folks linked arms and uh, and sent those positive messages and thanked companies that are are just focusing on being a company, I think that will make a difference. I, I do think there is a, a role in public policy um, because both at the state and federal level. So I think to your, your folks, your listeners also can vote and ask people who want their vote, whether it be for Congress or Senate or governor or AG or treasurer or state legislator, um, what do they think about these issues? What do they think about ESG and corporations being um, politicized? Or even they can, obviously, you know, in, in a couple of years, we'll have federal elections and they can ask, what do you think about the the Securities and Exchange Commission pushing this, or the EPA pushing that, um, and or the SEC, or I said the SEC, excuse me. Um, you need to ask those questions. The more that politicians get asked those questions, it forces them to think about it and and come to a position um, and land on it. And it, you know they have to get educated. So that that's a very important way. And I think just speaking out, um, giving feedback to companies, thoughtful feedback, saying, "Hey, I, I'm." You know, Disney, I, I don't think you should come out against the parental rights bill. This, this is a concern. So I, I think I will say finally, less is more. Um, I think tone down our rhetoric when we are communicating to companies and just be very brief. The same thing with, with politicians. I've worked on Capitol Hill. Um, a a two-sentence, uh, thoughtful, brief, calm uh, email uh, is is more powerful than a than a twelve paragraph screaming email. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I would just encourage your listeners to just speak briefly, calmly, uh, but to speak and and do that in lots of different ways: emails, texts, faxes, and your listeners probably don't even know what a fax is, but <laughs> calling, <laughs> calling, uh, whatever it takes. So I, I would just say, stay engaged. Don't give up. We we should not give up hope. Um, we we do believe that um, we we. We trust the Lord, um, and we just, but we're called to be faithful, and that, that's what we need to do. Amen. Well, there, there's a lot of wisdom there in, in what you just said, and, and I want to give the listeners a practical next step. If you are concerned, go check out the 1792 Exchange. Paul, how can they do that? 1792exchange.com. You go on the site, you go to our spotlight report. There are a couple different ways you can click there. And um, and that then you just go in and you can you can search by several ways. You could just it's a very simple search function. It's a simple site. You could type in a company if you're you're doing business with uh, J P Morgan Chase. Just start typing it in, and then you click on their uh, their rating. And a two a simple one and a half page report will come up. Everything is footnoted, and so you can you can see why are they getting a, a red, yellow, or green uh, rating, meaning high, medium, or lower risk, and then. You could take that and, like I said, print it. You could, or you could email it into a company. You could walk it into the to the bank, um, and have a have a calm, brief conversation, and and uh, ask for maybe your terms of service to be changed. Those are just very simple things. You can also go in and, and search by industry if you're looking to find a company in a certain type of industry. You could just say, I want all the the green or lower risk companies in this industry, and then you'll you'll have a a, a, sh a sorted list that filter. We're all, most of your folks are used to shopping and using filters, and it's just, it works the same way. Absolutely, and, and all that will be included in the show notes. Paul, thank you so much for what you're doing and for coming on and talking to us about this today. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, and I just encourage your folks to stay educated and stay engaged. Well, perhaps you've 
heard the phrase wall of separation between church and state. It's kind of a hot topic and and has been for for many years. And really, I don't think most people even know where that phrase comes from. And that's quite concerning. So what do you think of when you think of the phrase wall of separation between church and state? Is it in the Constitution? Where did that phrase come from and what does it mean? Well, joining me now is Howard Goldthwaite of the First Liberty Institute. He is the Senior Director of Creative Strategy there, and First Liberty is a legal organization that is dedicated to defending religious liberty. Howard, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about this. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. So I recently watched a, a, the video that's pushed, put, put out by First Liberty Institute narrated by Mm -hmm. you, and uh, it goes through, it's about a three to four minute video that goes through the history of the phrase separation between church and state, what it means, what it doesn't mean, where it comes from. So can you just tell my audience, where does that phrase come from? Sure. I, uh, I actually didn't know myself until I came to work at First Liberty. But our, our CEO, Kelly Shackelford, would occasionally tell that story that the wall of separation between church and state is not in the Constitution, as most people think. That phrase uh, was first used in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson on January 1st, 1802, and uh, a, group of, uh, a group called the Danbury Baptist Association, located in Connecticut, had written him uh, a couple months earlier, and they were concerned— that uh, the government was going to tell churches what to teach, what to preach, what to do, and uh, they wanted to get reassurance from the president that uh, that they could preach what they wanted to preach. And Jefferson wrote back, he said, not to worry, there's a wall of separation between the church and state, meaning we are protecting the church from control by the state. Now, to a lot of people back in that era, uh, having a lot of them had come from England, where they did have the the official Church of England, and the king was in charge of both the government and the church. And uh, with that memory fresh in their minds, they wanted to get reassurance that that wasn't going to happen here. There would no be there would not never be a Church of the United States that you had to had to join. And so he reassured them, "Nope, we're all about freedom. Freedom is one of our founding principles here in America. You don't have to worry about that." Yes, so when you look at England, uh, you you can read the story of Thomas Helwes, who was imprisoned, I believe, in the 1600s. Um, He was imprisoned after he became a Baptist. So he left the Church of England, the uh, the state, a nation-sponsored version of Christianity, and he wrote about his new Baptist beliefs, one of those which includes his belief in the separation of church and state. He did not believe in a state-sanctioned religious opposition that prohibited people from having their own conscience and their own beliefs when it, as it uh, pertained to religion. And Thomas Helwes was imprisoned for that. And so, a lot of individuals growing up hearing stories like that in England, it was very concerning to them, and they did not agree theologically with everything the Church of England. Um, taught, and so they had to leave the country so that they could have religious freedom. And, and, and when you study history, if you're honest, you you will see a lot of the groups that came to America early on were religious groups who were leaving England to f- flee state-sanctioned right. religious opposition. You're exactly right. The Puritans in particular, they came here, what, 1620? And uh, they kind of set the tone for the rest of the country that this is the place people come to for religious liberty. Absolutely. And in, in, in the colonies and the colonists and the early Americans had, you know, to learn um, exactly what that would mean. You know, even even coming over here, many of the states had their own state um, sanctioned religion doing just like the Church of England did. And they would persecute right. other colonists for not adhering to that colony's uh, sanctioned religion. And so it took some time yeah. and discussion to understand exactly what religious liberty would look like in this nation. You know, I love 
uh, <laughs> when a, opponents of the American founding and the American founding documents and American exceptionalism, they always want to point out the flaws of our nation. Yeah. And what I like to point yeah. out is, man, those, those flaws that we had really enabled us to have important conversations about how do we want this nation to look. And those early flaws that we see in the colonies – when when our founders in the you know late 1700s were creating this um, constitution and in the documents that would establish this new republic, everything that had been happening in the colonies was on the forefront of many of these conversations. You know, you can consider Thomas Leland, who was a Baptist minister, and he originally mm-hmm. opposed ratification of the constitution. And he said, what is clearest of all, religious liberty is not sufficiently secured. He knew, like many other Baptists, that there was a there was potential for a state sanction of a federal sanctioned religion to be established like it had been in many of the colonies. And he did not want as a Baptist minister to be persecuted because of his Baptist theology. Yeah. Wow. You know, Thomas Jefferson, uh, it may raise some eyebrows, but he was one of the few presidents who was not in favor of a Thanksgiving holiday. He thought the government should not be in the business of telling people what days they should, you know, pray or whatever. And uh, that's how fiercely he defended that separation. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love what you said. You, you, you said at the beginning that the idea, the original idea behind this separation between church and state is protecting the church from control by the state. And right. there's this beautiful, exactly right. beautiful line that that is in the video, and it says, talking about the Danbury Baptists, they asked Mr. Jefferson, will we be free to worship with total security? Are we the people allowed yep. to determine the content of every Sunday sermon? Or will we be told what we have to teach? Will it be controlled what the preacher can preach? Will we be free to to say in a prayer, and will we be free to pray anywhere? And then I think, you know, First Liberty actually represented Coach Kennedy um, when he That's prayed right. on the field. And and what's so interesting is those who want to use the phrase separation of church and state so much have actually flipped it to mean something completely different than what it actually means. <laughs> it, it, I know. It's exactly the opposite of Jefferson's intention. There's a, there's a scene in the video— uh, you know, they believe in the wall. They just don't believe it should be the same place other people think. They think it should be right around the edge of the church, <laughs> walling all the beliefs inside the church. And you can go inside the church, and you can pray and sing and all that, but don't bring your faith outside. That's kind of how the mentality they take. I, I call them the wall builders. Absolutely. Well, and in the video, you, you had said that, but sadly, his words, talking about Jefferson, have been misunderstood. Yeah. They have been twisted to do more harm than good. His words have been used to tell church people to keep their beliefs walled up in their steeple. Walls keep getting built at a furious pace. The problem is they are in the wrong place. They're being placed around churches, and churches are being told, as you said, keep your beliefs there. Whereas Jefferson meant to put the wall around the government to tell the government not to interfere with the church. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Coach Kennedy— uh, this past uh, Sunday, he was a guest at uh, First Baptist Church in Dallas, and I was listening to what he said on the radio. And he, he I didn't know this, but uh, well, he, it took like seven years to get to the Supreme Court. He, he went to case court after court, kept losing, losing, appealing, and this one court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, they they when they when they told him. When they ruled against him, they quoted Jesus when he said, you should pray in your closet, meaning that's the only place you're ever allowed to pray is in your closet. And they want to keep all our beliefs in a closet. They don't like it when we come out and live our authentic selves. So, Howard, did our founders envision a nation where the public arena was void of religious conviction? Oh, just the opposite. In fact, uh, the, the the Sunday after Jefferson wrote this famous letter, he went to a worship service which was held inside the nation's Capitol building. 
they graciously opened wow. the doors for people to come. They had a church service because they didn't have any building. Church, it was so new, churches hadn't had a chance to build their own buildings yet. So they opened up the actual national capital to have church services service inside those premises. Wow. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure people today would, would, would outcry. Saying, well, that, that that's not separation of church and state. Oh, you know who Kirk Cameron is? He's a actor and uh, and a, an author. He's going to be our guest this Friday. Really? On this show, we do our podcast called uh, First Liberty Live. He's written a Christian children's book, and he's been asking libraries to just have a story hour, much like the counterpart the drag queen story hour and he's getting so much pushback from libraries we don't want that here we've got to separate the church from the state and he became one of our clients and thanks to our involvement and defense of him he's now has been allowed to go into libraries and read his christian book as as, as he should be allowed to absolutely yeah i mean and and the reality is is when you paint any christian belief any religious belief for that matter as hateful, as yeah. radical extremist traditionalist <clears throat> beliefs, and you and, and you and you start using the government to say, well, you know, we need to we need to silence and censor this hateful, radical, uh, extreme traditionalism. Then you're going to do just the opposite. Of what That's was true. originally intended by Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist, they were writing him to say, "Please do not allow the federal government to interfere with our religious beliefs, with our practice, with our speaking about our Baptist beliefs." Yeah. And yet, those who use the phrase now are doing exactly what the Danbury Baptist That's worried right. they would do. You know, I think a lot of politicians fool a lot of people. But they they use the word you're free to worship, but what they the word they don't use is the free exercise of religion. They say you're free to go inside your church and worship however you want, but what they're against is the free exercise. They don't like you living out your faith outside those church walls. And you'll hear like Hillary Clinton and, and a lot of a lot of those types say, "Oh, I'm all for freedom of worship. <laughs> Just keep it inside your church," is what they mean. Right. Yeah, and, and that's completely opposite from from what we see. And, and you know, I almost wonder: are, are are the individuals that push this are they historically ignorant, or or do they willing uh, do they willingly twist the words of our founders to push their agenda? You know, if you go back to the to Massachusetts State uh, Constitution of seventeen eighty. You'll read in Article 2, it is the right as well as the duty of all men in society, publicly and at stated seasons, to worship the supreme being, the giant creator and preserver of the universe. And no subject shall be hurt, molested, or restrained in his person, liberty, or estate for worshiping God in the manner and season most agreeable to the dictates of his own conscience." or for his religious wow. profession or sentiments, provided he doth not disturb the public peace or obstruct others in his religious worship. That is the vision for this it's idea well of written, separation yeah. of church and state. <laughs> Much better uh, written than, than modern-day legislation, I'll oh, say that. God. But just this idea of no person is going to be restrained, not only in their estate, as you mentioned, in, the, in their closet at home— but they yeah, also yeah. wrote in in his person and liberty. We're not going to restrain him from worshiping God according to the dictates of his own conscience, which today they only take that last phrase. Well, in his estate, at his home, in his closet, on his personal time where no one else can see, then we won't, you know, uh try to get him to uh you know, disagree with the dictates of his own conscience. But in his person and liberty outside of that, we absolutely will keep him from exercising his religious liberty because separation of church and state. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a phrase, freedom of religion. There's a group called the Freedom From Religion Association, <laughs> and they're a, a frequent opponent of ours in court. They think that uh, religion should be kept out of the public eye. We're free from religion, not the free exercise. 
which is again the opposite of what the government in Jefferson's letter intended there we shall not prohibit free exercise thereof that that's their intention to prohibit free exercise thereof absolutely and and talking about um you know if, when you look at when you look at America America did not have a christian founding if you mean that America was a theocracy America has never been a theocracy however as I stated earlier, I think you have to be intellectually dishonest and historically ignorant to not believe that our founding was deeply shaped by Christian and, and moral truths. And the reason why you had Baptist ministers like Thomas Leland who did not think that, you know, he, he actually said, heaven forbids um, the bans of marriages between churches and state, their embraces thereof must be unlawful, because he realized that salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit not of a body of legislators. And David Clausen at the Family yeah. Research Council put that God has sole jurisdiction over the soul, not the federal government. So a marketplace sure. of these free and competing ideas is most preferred to one where only one train of thought is allowed. But yet, what do we see today? You're only allowed to think and speak freely about one religion in the public sphere, and that is the secular yeah. leftist religion. All right. Yeah, exactly. So Humanism. The, well, they think man's wisdom is superior to God's wisdom. They've elevated themselves above that, and that that's a, a huge mistake. Absolutely. So what what is the balance between religious liberty and the role that religion should play, you know, if someone is religious and they come to the public arena with their religious convictions, what is the balance uh -huh. there that we, we seek? Well, I think uh, it comes down to freedom. No one should tell you uh, what to believe, what to preach, what to teach, or to stop you from exercising your beliefs. Like you mentioned that, that uh, Massachusetts uh, document from 1780s, it, as long as you don't interfere with the other people or whatever. I think that's the dividing line. I, I don't think we should tackle people on the sidewalk and hold a knife to their throat and make them believe like we do. But uh, I think uh, just you should be allowed to exercise your faith in public without fear of, of, uh, of attacks. And so how can we change this idea that what separation of church and state means – today uh -huh. how can we get back to the original meaning of separation of church and state well i think uh i think if you go to we have a website called rfia.org it stands for restoring faith in america and you'll find uh you you can uh, learn you can get legal help and you can also share your own stories either ask for help or guidance or share the victory you you've achieved or whatever and it's a great place to start. And also, if you have been persecuted, uh, you know, fired or, or whatever because of your faith, please contact First Liberty, and uh, and we can give you some some uh, some advice. Maybe even take up your case if possible. Well, thank you so much, Howard. And and how can people connect with First Liberty and and watch that video? Well, it's on YouTube. Just put in "No Better Letter." That's an easy way to find it. I think it's also on the FirstLiberty.org website. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, getting a lot of hits. And uh, please post a comment. Oh, please like it and tell your friends. It's, it's great for homeschoolers because uh, this is a topic. It just makes it really clear what what that phrase means. And you know, in the in the process of writing this this script for the video, I watched a lot of. Uh, lectures by academic scholars and i was amazed how they could take something so interesting and make it so boring and i don't think kids are going to want to sit through those type things but this <laughs> the story kind of gets to the heart of the matter and it has fun visuals that explain it i think it's a great way to teach kids and, and adults too what it really means absolutely and i think while the adults are allowing their kids to watch this video they'll be learning a lot too <laughs> So. Yeah, I think so too. I think it uh, it helps you in your mind be able to explain it to somebody else because it, it just makes it clear and simple. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. That 
that's when a lot of people go off the rails. They just complicate something that's so simple. Well, thank you so much, Howard, for joining us and talking about this today. Well, I, I want to mention I'm really uh, in admiration of you and your courage to what you've been through and your own personal uh, faith freedom journey with your job and getting the, getting the hook from your from your police force. And I just really think God has big things for you for taking a stand for him. Thank you so much, Howard. I appreciate that. I wish you the best. Thanks for the call. The reality is the walls have been placed in the wrong place. Make sure you check out First Liberty. Check out the show notes. At Real Jacob Kersey, we'll see you back next week on the Jacob Kersey program. Thanks so much for listening.